Press. I am press. I don't care. Get down. I am press. I don't care. Get down. Okay, I'm down. I'm down. I am press. Please. We are at an extremely dangerous moment in the history of this country. Donald Trump wants to jail journalists who publish stories he doesn't like. Do you mind telling me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest? And he's wielding the Espionage Act like a chainsaw against journalistic sources. We're going to find the leakers. We're going to find the leakers. They're going to pay a big price for leaking. Let that sink in for a second. At the same time that the U.S. government is chasing journalists all over the world, they have decided that all foreign journalists have no protection under the First Amendment in the United States. So that goes to... to to show the gravity of this case. Oh, whoa. Oh. Amelia, can you hear us? Amelia, are you okay? And I'll ask the same question. Will you commit to not putting reporters in jail for doing their jobs? Well, I don't know that I can make a blanket commitment to that effect. We will uh, utilize the authorities that we have legally and constitutionally uh, if we have to. It's another attack on free press, just like Julian Assange after publishing information that exposed government corruption. Glenn Greenwald from The Intercept has been charged. The claim the Brazilian government used against me was one modeled after the Assange indictment. This is a war on freedom of speech and it's a war on journalists. The U.S. government is asserting universal jurisdiction to reach over to any journalist anywhere in the world that reports on it in a way that it doesn't like and prosecute them. Mr. Assange was arrested this morning at about 10 o'clock at the Ecuadorian embassy. This precedent means that any journalist can be extradited for prosecution in the United States for having published truthful information about the United States. Come on, fire. First, they came for Julian. They will come for everybody else. Our children, our friends. There is a war on journalism, and Julian is at the center of that. But the point is that what happens to him can happen to any journalist who does his or her job. How did we get here? The case against Julian Assange started a decade ago, but today it is the case that will define press freedom and by consequence, your freedom of speech. This is my philosophical background, how I see this work that we're doing. And maybe one other component is that while we can all write about our own political issues, we can all push for particular things we can believe in. We can all have particular brands of politics. But I say it's actually, it's all bankrupt. And the reason it's all bankrupt and all current political theories are bankrupt and particular lines of political thought is because actually we don't know what the hell is going on. And until we know the basic structures of our institutions, how they operate in practice is titanic organization, how they behave inside, not just through stories, but through vast amounts of internal documentation. Until we know that, how can we possibly make a diagnosis? How can we set the direction to go until we know where we are? We don't even have a map of where we are. So our, our first task is to build up the sort of the intellectual heritage that describes where we are. And once we know where we are, then we have a hope of setting course for a different direction. Until then, I think all political theories, to greater and lesser extents, of course, uh, are bankrupt. In 2011, a secret grand jury was meeting in Alexandria, Virginia, to consider indicting Julian Assange under the Espionage Act. This isn't about who Julian Assange is, because that's been used so much as a distraction and I think so much of the negative press about about Assange has been exactly about that it's been exactly about oh we'll get people to ignore what the issues are because we'll get them to to be distracted 
that this is not an issue about press freedom. It's actually about an individual. It's not. It's about press freedom. You know, it doesn't matter who the individual was in that position. That position needs to be defended. And in this case, it is Julian. But the role that he undertook is one that absolutely needs defending by the rest of the media. The Obama administration concluded that there was no way to charge Assange without endangering press freedom. However, in 2019, the Trump administration took a different approach. In an unprecedented move, the Justice Department has indicted WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange for his role in publishing U.S. military and diplomatic documents exposing U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. But Assange faces up to 170 years in prison under the new charges, 10 years for each count of violating the Espionage Act. Julian Assange has been indicted under the Espionage Act with 17 separate counts related to his work as a publisher with WikiLeaks for having received and published classified information. Journalists around the world at The Guardian, at The New York Times, at Der Spiegel, at Le Monde, also received and published that information. But that's true of journalists around the world all the time receiving information from government, including from the United States government. It does not make them spies and it does not make it espionage. Assange is charged with soliciting and receiving classified information. Uh, that's what I do for a living. I solicit and I receive information. I ask questions and I hope to obtain answers. Uh, and uh, where there's evidence available, I, I try to get the evidence. Journalists in the so-called mainstream, in its various forms, are now realizing that it concerns them. They come for Julian Assange, they'll come for you. All these practices of encryption, helping your sources uh, provide information legally are important for letting citizens and the world know what's going on. Otherwise, we're dependent on our government to tell us what's up. And I don't think that's a dependable way to get information out to citizens. They won't do that. Welcome to the State Department. I think we have some interns in the back. Welcome. Uh, good to see you in this uh, exercise of transparency and democracy. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? WikiLeaks is the most extraordinary development in journalism in my lifetime. WikiLeaks meant that everything you read was authentic, was accurate. You could judge it on its face value. There's no journalism. Even the best could never be 100% authentic and accurate. In 2010, WikiLeaks started publishing the largest collection of U.S. military and diplomatic secret documents in history. WikiLeaks first published a video of two American Apache helicopters murdering 11 people in Baghdad, among them two Reuters journalists. This video, alongside maybe the, the uh, images from Abu Ghraib, are, in a sense, what the, the napalm girl photo uh, tells us about the Vietnam War. So it in, captures so many elements of the, the uh, callousness, the, uh, the bloodlust, and the, the horror of the Iraq War. Light them all up. Come on, fire! If you watch it through, there's nowhere to go after it. You can't be rationalized. It can't be excused. You don't need to be a specialist to see that U.S. soldiers have been intentionally massacring people. Come on, buddy. I got you pick up a weapon. Even if they had, some of them have carried arms, once they're wounded and out of combat, Targeting them becomes a war crime. So it's obvious. It's Bush Seven. Go ahead. Roger. We have a black SUV or a bongo truck picking up the body. Fuck. Request permission to engage. Bushmaster Seven. Roger. It's Bushmaster Seven. Roger. Engage. One eight. Okay. Clear. Come on. Clear. Clear. It was murder.
360 degree killing. That was the so-called philosophy on the war. In other words, you killed everything within 360 degrees. The collateral murder video wasn't an isolated incident. WikiLeaks then published the Afghan and Iraq war logs, nearly half a million documents of detailed incident reports conducted by the US that depicted the true cost of those wars. I'm not surprised by the data. What I am is deeply upset by the data. It's impossible to read the data. When you read about a six-year-old being tortured to death with a drill, when you read about an entire family being wiped out in a split second because some 18-year-old American soldier has decided that the car was going too fast and just opened fire. When you hear about uh, people being locked in a prison for two months and suspended from the ceiling by the Iraqi military, when you read stories about entire towns being decimated or children being killed by Hellfire missiles fired from US Apache helicopters because they were gathering firewood. All these stories are horrific. They're, it's, it's, it's painful. It is up to a court to decide clearly whether something is in the end a crime. That said, prima facie, there does appear to be evidence of war crimes in this material. Example is the Task Force 373 high Mars missile strike uh, on a house which killed seven children. Well, we would like to see this material, uh, the revelations that this material gives be taken seriously, investigated uh, by governments and new policies put in place as a result, if not uh, prosecutions uh, of those people who have committed abuses. No one has been prosecuted for this. We have clear evidence for systematic torture. Again, the whistleblower is the one who's being prosecuted, but not the perpetrators. For just the third time since he was arrested over two years ago, alleged Army whistleblower Bradley Manning was seen by the public this week. His three-day pretrial hearing wraps up today before a military court at Fort Meade in Maryland. Manning faces 22 charges, including the capital offense of aiding the enemy, as well as violating the Espionage Act, computer fraud, and theft of records. The 24-year-old private is accused of leaking hundreds of thousands of documents to the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks, including secret files on the Iraq and Afghan wars. Manning's attorneys are seeking the dismissal of 10 of the counts. A few months after, WikiLeaks released Cablegate. That's the scale of it, a vast leak of thousands of documents from US embassies and other diplomatic outposts across the globe in all those countries. There are stories from every country involved that will embarrass, intrigue, and potentially complicate international relations. Among the specifics, worries about security at a Pakistan nuclear facility, concern about alleged links between the Russian government and the mafia, plus allegations and examples of corruption within the Afghan government. Britain's Guardian newspaper said some cables showed Saudi King Abdullah repeatedly urging the U.S. to attack Iran to destroy the program, and that leaders of other Arab nations referred to Tehran as an existential threat. Those documents... I think for the general public, it was, it was quite a revelation that people who have all the privileges of diplomats actually were behaving like thugs. Italy's foreign minister calls the document release the September 11th of world diplomacy in that everything once accepted as normal has now changed. It was truth telling of the most powerful kind, most fearsome kind almost. And of course, there was a reaction. The United States strongly condemns the illegal disclosure. I think the man is a high tech terrorist. Um, he's done in the sense. Yeah, he's done an enormous damage uh, to our country. And I think he needs to be prosecuted to the full, fullest extent of the law. And if that becomes a problem, we need to change 
the law. The way to deal with this is pretty simple. We got special ops forces. I mean, a, a dead man can't leak stuff. This guy's a traitor, a treasonous, and, and, and he has broken every law of the United States. The guy ought to be, and I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I don't want to do it. Illegally shoot the son of a He's going to talk about leaking like you had nothing to do with the leaking no, of those documents. It's disgraceful. You do think it's disgraceful? I think this should be like death penalty or something. Uh, that reaction we now see um, encapsulated in the almost desperate bid by the United States to put Julian in a black hole and throw away the key. That's what they're talking about if he's extradited. There is an attempt now, um, a very worrying attempt in the United States to erect a, a new precedent, which is that in the national security sector, that any journalist that corresponds with a source is committing espionage if at some time a classified communication is made. If, if I am a con, uh, conspirator to commit espionage, uh, then all these other media organizations and the principal journalists in them are also conspirators uh, to commit espionage. That's absolutely true. Yes, that's absolutely true to me. I haven't spotted that. I was so excited about the fact that this conceals the fact they called it an air support because a reaper UAV which proceeded to uh, loose off a hellfire missile, which most probably ended up with two children with shrapnel the next day. With increasing pressure due to the publications, Julian Assange feared an imminent extradition to the US and in 2012 was forced to seek asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy. I asked President Obama to do the right thing. The United States must renounce its witch hunt against WikiLeaks. The United States must dissolve its FBI investigation. The United States must vow that it will not seek to prosecute our staff or our supporters. The United States must pledge before the world that it will not pursue journalists for shining, shining a light on the secret crimes of the powerful. There must be no more foolish talk about prosecuting any media organization ¿Por qué se dio el asilo a Assange? Assange me parece que entra en la embajada en julio. Casi dos meses nos pasamos estudiando el caso de Julian Assange. Ni siquiera te puedo decir es que estábamos de acuerdo con todo lo que había hecho Assange. Pero era claro que no había garantías para un debido proceso. Era claro que desde Estados Unidos, ciertos grupos tremendamente agresivos, los halcones norteamericanos, querían juzgar a Julian Assange había grandes probabilidades de su extradición a Estados Unidos, donde podía enfrentar incluso la pena de muerte. And so began Julian Assange's seven-year-long stay inside the tiny Ecuadorian embassy in central London. Can everyone hear me? Hello, Cambridge, can you hear me? I can hear you, Andrew. I can see your room. Bye, bye, everyone. Just now, bro. tiny Ecuadorian embassy in central London. Can everyone hear me? Uh, my name is Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA uh, in Hawaii. 29-year-old young man 
in a foreign jurisdiction that he had no experience with, the subject of the largest intelligence manhunt the world has ever seen. And the realities were, for Edward Snowden, knew he was going to be smashed. And at that moment, he reached out and asked us for help. We managed to get him out of Hong Kong, uh, but when he landed in the Moscow airport, the uh, American government had cancelled uh, his passport. While all of these news organizations around the world, all of these publishers were trying to get a piece of the story, there was only one publisher that actually said, we want to help the source. We want to make sure he's okay. We want to make sure that no matter what happens, you know, he has somebody on his side. And that was WikiLeaks. In the moment that happens Snowden, se cierran las puertas diplomáticas. O sea, eso fue un cerrón de puertas en, en Reino Unido. Eso cerró las posibilidades de discusión y negociación. O sea, ese fue el precio, el precio por la libertad de Snowden fue la libertad de Julian. Assange was aware of the possible consequences of helping Snowden. I, I think that is a important lesson that actually an organization that specializes in defeating surveillance for national security cases was the organization that was able to do this. Yes, we had some diplomatic contacts and, and we certainly had the will uh, and the desire to not see another uh, Chelsea Manning. But I think a lot of it, we couldn't have done that if um, we hadn't specialized in these secure communications techniques. Despite the increasing threats and deteriorating conditions in the embassy, WikiLeaks continued to publish. Some of the CIA's most sophisticated and effective spying tools apparently pried open tonight with the help of WikiLeaks. The anti-secrecy group says it's obtained thousands of files. The CIA is equipped with a variety of hacking tools to crack into phones, cars, computers, even smart TVs. As a result of these publications, in 2017, the newly appointed director of the CIA, Mike Pompeo, in an unprecedented manner, dedicated his first public address to a publisher. Julian Assange and his kind are not the slightest bit interested in improving civil liberties or enhancing personal freedom. They have pretended America's First Amendment freedoms shield them from justice. They may have believed that, but they're wrong. WikiLeaks walks like a hostile intelligence service and talks like a hostile intelligence service. The private security company UC Global hired by Ecuador to protect Assange, cut a deal with the CIA to spy on Assange and the Ecuadorian diplomats. Together with these is the immediate accessibility to the newest major exposition, convention and meeting facility in the city of Las Vegas. In 2016, the owner of UC Global, David Morales, flew to Las Vegas to attend a security fair. As soon as Morales returned from this fateful trip to Las Vegas, he began bragging to his employees back in southern Spain that we will from now on be playing in the first division using a you know, soccer metaphor, a football metaphor. But the, they were violating their contract with Ecuador and secretly working for the Americans via Sheldon Adelson. The CIA laundered payments to UC Global through Las Vegas Sands, a company owned by Trump mega donor Sheldon Adelson. Una persona que no se identifica, me contacta, me llama por teléfono y recuerdo perfectamente que cuando comienza la conversación me indica, hola, eh, tú no me conoces, pero yo a ti sí te conozco perfectamente. Entonces eh, yo le pregunto, pero ¿y de qué me conoces? Y él me indica. Eh, te conozco porque durante mucho tiempo has sido uno de mis objetivos. Eh, te he seguido, eh, te he grabado, he escuchado tus conversaciones, tengo toda tu documentación eh, personal, tu pasaporte. Durante un montón de tiempo has sido uno de mis principales objetivos. An elaborate plan was set up between Morales and the CIA to install surveillance cameras with audio capabilities and implant covert microphones in strategic places, such as below this fire extinguisher in the embassy's meeting room and behind this box in the toilet. 
Assange held meetings in this toilet for fear of being spied on. En lugar de proteger a Julian Assange, se dedicaron en forma absolutamente ilegal, atentando contra el derecho a la privacidad, atentando contra los derechos humanos, a espiar a Julian Assange, cooptados por la CIA. The CIA's increasing obsession to entrap Assange alarmed a UC Global staffer who blew the whistle when asked to target Assange's family and even plot an attempt against his life. They came forward and they spoke to our lawyers and they exposed what had been going on there because they had played a part in it. And they said that what their boss had been telling them is that they were working for the CIA and that those instructions about getting Gabriel's DNA, that was coming from the other side of the Atlantic. These instructions were coming from the United States. It reads like some really terrible spy novel. Plots to kidnap, plots to possibly poison Julian Assange while he was in the embassy. I mean, it's almost too crazy to be real. And it is real. It's hard for people to understand that such lawlessness is possible. So there's incredible criminality that has been going on in order to gather information about Julian's lawyers and his family and journalists who were visiting him. I mean, it's shocking and I'm very fearful. I've been in a permanent state of fear for years. UC Global sent video, audio and other information about Assange, WikiLeaks staff, his visitors and the Ecuadorian diplomats to a CIA server. They also recorded Assange's medical consultations and went as far as recording Assange's privileged legal conversations with his lawyers. When Daniel Ellsberg was um, on trial for the Pentagon Papers during the Vietnam War, uh, his case was thrown out because it came out that Nixon had ordered a raid on his psychologist's office to try and get information which was embarrassing to Ellsberg. So, of course, that should have happened, and it was right that it happened. Assange has been surveilled by the CIA. That by itself should mean the case is thrown out. There's no chance you can have a fair trial if the people who are prosecuting have been surveying the defendant as he's been having privileged conversations with his lawyers. It's completely irregular that it hasn't been thrown out on those grounds already. I mean, really, it's outrageous. I didn't expect to find torture, to be honest. I thought, well, this is you know, the UK, they've arrested him, they, they'll treat him well, you know, uh, maybe there's some issues, procedural issues, but uh, I, was, I was genuinely shocked then that we found all the symptoms that you would find typically in a person who has been exposed to psychological torture. And <clears throat> in that context, I have to stress that psychological torture is by no means torture light. Yeah, it is very serious. In fact, psychological torture was initially systematically developed by the Nazis when they were not able to break resistance fighters with physical means, they developed psychological torture because it was even worse. He, he was arrested in, in April 2019 Within a couple of months, probably less, he'd lost up to 15 kilos in weight. And his brother, Gabriel, who I went in to see him with once, was shocked when he held his arm and realized how thin he was. He was subjected to a psyops operation, I would think. It certainly had it had its effect on him physically and no doubt mentally. Torture is being used against Julian Assange to intimidate the world, to show them if ever you get the idea to disclose our secrets and to wash our, expose our dirty laundry to the world, this is what's going to happen to you. I feel like Julian's life might be coming to an end. It's been 10 years, nine years, no, 10 years of breaking someone down, of trying to destroy his life. And it's a well-known pattern, you know, whistleblowers, people who expose the powerful. 
they destroy them. Throughout the 10 years that the Assange case has been ongoing, there have been a number of irregularities. The destruction of evidence by prosecutors, arbitrary detention, lack of access to his lawyers, judges with alleged conflicts of interest, mistreatment, illegal espionage, and the political nature of the charges themselves. All this is reason enough to shut the extradition proceedings and the prosecution down, but Assange still faces 175 years in prison. Julian Assange is now in a high security prison in conditions which are quite close to solitary confinement, where he is at serious risk of contracting COVID simply because of an indictment from the Trump administration in respect of publications for which he's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, publications for which he won the Walkley Award for Most Outstanding Contribution to Journalism. That's how stark this situation is. Come on, buddy. I got you to pick up a weapon. We started by looking at the husband of the chief magistrate, Lady Arbuthnot, um, who's made a number of rulings on, uh, on, on the Assange case. We found that her, her husband was a, a conservative defence minister. He financially benefited from corporations that had been exposed by WikiLeaks. We then did an investigation of her son, who is a cybersecurity expert and the vice president of a private equity group. And we found that this private equity group was heavily invested in a firm called Dark Trace, which was set up by the British intelligence establishment. So huge conflicts of interest. She has never recused herself in the case, which is irregular in itself, because I've talked to lawyers who have said if there's any hint of conflict of interest, judges will recuse themselves very early on. But she never has. It's constant. It's constant. Yeah. <laughs> We've had this issue before about March as well. Apparently they, know, they didn't know about the booth. So this is a constant problem, whether I'll turn up for a prison visit with him down at the prison and they won't have brought him out, which means I sit there on my own for an hour while he's coming in or while we're coming into the prison, there's delays getting in because there's huge queues and security's not working properly. So I don't actually get him to see him until half an hour after the actual visit time has started and he's sitting there on his own wondering whether anyone's turning up. And it just means that a two-hour visit ends up being only an hour or less um, and we lose time. And so or we turn up to court being told that we'll have the whole day with him and um, instead when, then, when we get there we're told, no, actually there's no facilities, you can only have an hour with him. And this, this has been constant for months and months and months on end, which has really limited our ability to get through any of the evidence with him. This is a hugely I'm complicated sure case with a huge amount of evidence to get through. Assange is a symbol, really, uh, of... Uh, of the American, the American state's affront at having its secrets put out in the public domain. You know, that's, that's, that's what it comes down to. Uh, and it's why I think of it as a political case. He's been blamed for a whole series of things which patently untrue, but the impetus behind the extradition uh, uh, request has, has not stopped, uh, which tells you it wasn't to do with those things. It's about high politics and him being a symbol of what they see as an assault on the American state. Uh, but most of the rest of the world would see as uh, legitimate journalism. Now, what makes you think Julian Assange is going to get justice in the United States, in a court in East Virginia, where the jury is selected from a population where 85% are employed by CIA, NSA, DOD, or DOS? I hired O.J. Simpson's jury consultant in my case. He has never lost a case. He represented O.J. Simpson and William Kennedy Smith and George Zimmerman in the Trayvon Martin uh, case. He's a winner. And we got him a security clearance. He came to Washington and he reviewed all the documents. And at the end of it, he said to me, if we were in any other district in America besides the Eastern District of Virginia, I would say, let's go for it. We're going to win. But the Eastern District of Virginia, he said, your jury would be made up of people from the CIA, the FBI, the Pentagon, the Department of Homeland Security, and intelligence community contractors, or their family members. He said, you don't stand a chance in the Eastern District of Virginia. That's why they charged you there. I fear the same thing for Julian. 
that they charged him in the Eastern District of Virginia because it's called the Espionage Court, because no, no national security defendant has ever won a case there. And then we see now how the British judiciary, who has a long tradition of rule of law, a proud tradition of that, has delivered a complete travesty of a trial where the defendant has not had the right to, def to prepare his defense, where he has not had access to his own lawyers, where we have court judges refusing to consider objections for conflicts of interest. Even in the UK, he's not going to get a fair extradition trial. So this is no longer in the hands of the judiciary. The judiciary is unwilling or unable to deal with this according to the rule of law. This is now in the hands of the public and in the hands of the media to inform the public about what is going on. On February the 24th, 2020, the first part of Julian Assange's extradition hearing took place. I'm here from Reporters Without Borders. We've been monitoring all week. Um, today, we were again concerned about Mr. Assange's well-being. And frankly, the treatment is dehumanizing. The fact that he is an afterthought almost twice now this week. Uh, proceedings have started without a realization that he was not even yet present. Julian is not receiving a fair hearing. To start with, he can hardly and barely hear what's going on in the courtroom. He cannot communicate with his lawyers without being observed and overheard by officials from the State Department, from the embassy, and from the Eastern District Court of Virginia. So how can he actually have a fair opportunity? Uh, and he, as he said, when he was communicating, attempted to communicate with the judge, there's been enough spying on the communication between me and my lawyer. The remainder of the extradition hearing recommences on September 7th, 2020. Due to COVID restrictions, Assange has not been allowed to see his lawyers in over six months. On June 24th, the US Department of Justice published a replacement superseding indictment on its website, but it was only delivered to the court three and a half weeks before the hearing and after the deadline to present new evidence had come and gone. This left Assange and his defense team with little time to adequately prepare a defense. Facing 175 years in prison, Julian Assange will likely not see his lawyers until the day of the hearing. This is not about left or right in politics. We can unite on this. Please tell everybody that you know that they have to side with Assange and fight against the extradition. If they tell you, I would rather fight for the environment or against animal cruelty, or gender equality, tell them. They are about to take every right away from you. You will not be able to fight for any other cause. We are talking about the fundamentals here. We must fight against the definition. We must save King Hassan. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you found that enlightening and useful. I thought it was an incredibly powerful and a very disturbing uh, film. Um, and I find it particularly shocking, actually, that you only see this story, this narrative, uh, on a film that can be that is being streamed. That you you literally do not hear the story at all in the mainstream. And that's one of the things that I think we'll be addressing. Um, in the discussion. I'm very pleased that there are hundreds of people joining from around the world. Um, we have people from uh, Erbil in Iraq. We have people from Tuscaloosa in, uh, in Alabama. We've had a message from Alicia Castro. We've had uh, some support from the Schiller Institute in Germany. Uh, the list goes on and on. People from almost every corner of the globe are tuning into this stream. So that's very, very encouraging. Um, what I'm gonna do now is to ask each of our panelists to just give, um, for, for, for a few minutes, about five minutes, just give their initial uh, thoughts on the film, on where we're at with the case. Um, and then from there, we'll go straight to the 
uh, Q&A. And I'm going to ask the maker of the film, um, Aaron Passarelli, uh, to, uh, to start the conversation. Um, and I would just like to say congratulations, Juan. It's a very, very impressive and I think very, very important film. So go ahead and give us your, uh, your initial thoughts, please. A very trivial thing. Uh, I ended up um, exporting the film today at 8.30 in the morning because I was making superficial, very tiny, high definition uh, changes to it. And um, Zoom doesn't support them. <laughs> I was kind of disappointed Ted, that you didn't get to see it like that. You can go and see it. It's on Twitter already. Um, and now, okay. So why did I do this film? I wanted to do it earlier, actually. I have been a friend of Julian and we've collaborated in a number of projects over the last 10 years. I met him in October uh, 2010 when they, uh, when, when they released the Iraq war logs. I was hired to film them. And I think I'm the filmmaker that has um, 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 filmed him and the team most out of all documentary filmmakers there are. Um, so I've been really, really close throughout all these years um, um, in, in, uh, to this case. And I realized that when I talk to people that are not as famous as I am, um, they, they just get snippets. And there's been so much, if we just think about the publications, there's been so much information there throughout 10, 12, 13 years that the organization has been going on. Uh, just that is enormous. Plus, then there's a whole layer of propaganda that the United States and other intelligence agencies have been pushing out and the media has been, you know, amping out uh, for the last 10 years. And, um, and then there's uh, other misleading information and uh, even conspiracy theory. So there's a whole lot of noise. Um, so I figured what I have to do is try to get rid of all the noise and folks focus on the basics. We knew since 2010 that the, the real battle was um, to preserve national security journalism because as soon as those uh, disclosures came out, uh, we knew that there was a secret investigation um, in Alexandria, Virginia, and there was probably a sealed indictment. And the war was to be fought for freedom of the press against the United States. Uh, so everything that happened in between um, in, in concerning Julian Assange's personal legal cases um, has been distraction, as, I, uh, as I, I, I could put it. Thanks very much, Juan. Um, I'd like to go straight over now to, uh, to Ken Loach for his um, thoughts on the film. Thanks, Chris. Um, th this is a very important film and congratulations to Juan. It's very important and people should see it. Um, just two or three points I'd like to make. I mean, first of all, the thing that strikes you is the sheer horror of the facts that are revealed. The sheer horror of that assassination of those 11 unarmed civilians and the image the one amongst the many horrific ones the one image that I cannot get, now get out of my head is of the six-year-old child tortured by Drew I mean that's unspeakable a war crime and we need to know these things we absolutely need to know them the horror of what is revealed secondly the suffering and torture of Julian Assange and it's very salutary and and can I say, I think all the people who spoke were very measured and were very thoughtful and were very authoritative. They can't be discounted, any of them, particularly good to see my old friend John Pilger speaking so eloquently. But the, the, the UN rapporteur, um, Niels Milzer, if I've got his name right, speaking about the war crimes, but also speaking about the torture of Julian Assange. When you have the UN rapporteur saying that, and we do not even hear that in our ma mainstream media. What an indictment that is of the news as it's presented to us. The spying, the plots to kill Julian. Um, th this is on a par with uh, Putin and the poisoning. 
Um, we have no, there's no moral superiority in the West speaking about Putin's antics when you have the, the US doing exactly the same to someone in our own, in our own, in our own land. This is, this is an attempt at poisoning torture within, in, in, in central London, right next, right in the heart of central London. Now, everyone knows the real story. Everyone can see it. We, we, we can't believe that anyone is hoodwinked. Um, it's not espionage, this is journalism. And when you get a right-wing politician like David Davis saying that Assange is a political prisoner, everyone knows it. The Guardian know it, who took his stories and then disowned him. The BBC knows it. Channel 4 knows it. Every, every serious editor of a current affairs programme of a national newspaper knows this is the truth. And yet they are silent. The journalists are silent. The lawyers are silent. Now, why are lawyers silent when they see our legal system so traduced? When there's an essential feature of our constitution is the separation of powers. The executive and the, and the legal system are meant to be separate. And yet this is plainly not the case, as, as this film has demonstrated and is, is plain to everyone to see. Where are they? Where, where are the politicians? Keir Starmer finds himself in a very interesting position. He was head of the um, uh, um, prosecution service. Uh, was he head when, when the message went through to, uh, to Sweden to, um, uh, to, to, to keep that case going? Was he there? What does he know? He should be challenged. He should be challenged. This is a test for him in particular, but all the politicians should speak up. Uh, Starmer speaks of openness uh, in, in, in his dealings. We'll let him be open about this and let's hear what he says about the torture and the illegal oppression of Julian Assange. So the, we, we, I think, may I just say, I think the, the issue of what happened in Sweden is maybe something that we shall talk about because that's important that this discussed, respected, but of course all the evidence around it needs to be made clear. Um, but a brilliant film and, and thanks for sharing, thanks for making it one. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, I'll now hand over to Susie Gilbert. Hi everyone, hi everyone all over the world. I see many names I recognize and really amazing allies from all over the place. So it's great to be with you all. Um, I'd echo what Ken said about Juan's film. There's a lot of information and I think Juan does a beautiful job of focusing it. And as Ken said, there are so many sort of sober authoritative voices um, and I think it speaks volume that Ken Loach of, of all filmmakers, who to me is like one of the masters of a sort of cinema of empathy, um, is here with us speaking about, you know, this case. And, and to me, that's what so many of these revelations are about, is about sort of, you know, black and brown lives all over the world matter. Um, and I think so. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad Ken and Juan are here today. Um, I just say that we're just over a week away from the beginning of the hearing in London on September 7th, as most of you know. Um, it's a relentlessly bleak news cycle, as we all know, but I do feel um, really energized and motivated that we have this historic case coming up and that we can all get super involved and activated and share this film and there's a lot we can be doing. Um, we've seen letters from hundreds of lawyers around the world, um, hundreds of doctors around the world, press freedom groups, all the leading human rights groups, even the editorial boards of newspapers that have had bumpy journeys with Julian have spoken out about this case. So even though historically the mainstream media has been quiet, I think the discourse has changed. And finally, late in the day at this late hour, um, I think there is fairly mainstream consensus that this extradition is totally, this, this case is unwarranted and should be dropped. Thanks very much, Susie. So uh, now we've got some time for, uh, for questions. We, we're getting questions in from all over the place, from all over the world on many different platforms. Um, I'll just start with um, 
a few uh, sort of general points, uh, partly about the case and partly about uh, the, the kind of media response. Um, one is, which I, I suppose is initially for Juan, but has um, wider uh, implications is, what made you create this documentary in the first place, Juan? But also how has journalism developed and responded in the 10 years uh, since then? Um, I'll also, there's a number of other questions related to that, related to the response of the media. Um, one in particular is what do you think of the role of uh, some of the liberal press, including the Guardian and the BBC, when it's come to this case? Um, and then one other question, which is, uh, how is it that no one was prosecuted for war crimes as a result of some of the uh, revelations from, um, from WikiLeaks? You don't have to all answer all of them. If you just want to pick one of them, then, uh, then, then we can go through them like that. But I'll start with Juan. Well, um, it's, I, I want to start by saying, I mean, when I was starting this, this film, I heard um, one of... Uh, the WikiLeaks team uh, say, actually it was, uh, well, I, I'd rather not say who it was, but a political prisoner in the UK, who would have thought that 10 years ago, right? I remember being in Norfolk in 2011, early 2011, it was cold and it was snowy. And and we and that all these releases were coming out. And, and um, you know, the focus was on, on on the crime, on the torture, on on the assassinations. You know, there was assassination squads. There, there was a group of um, uh, military uh, uh, forces um, led by the U.S. that went into a house, tied people up, executed them, including children, and then ordered a bombing to hide the evidence. Um, there's uh, hundreds of cases of of that type of thing um, and and that's what kept kept us going um, now you know 10 year later 10 years later we find ourselves in what is I think the most important case of freedom of speech and freedom of the press in our lives um, people say if if Julian is, is extradited the precedent will be set that I think is completely incorrect. Um, the president has already been said. If if we get um, if if Julian if if a, a Guardian uh, journalist or a New York Times journalist, Washington Post journalist receives information like the one that um, um, we got, uh, uh, WikiLeaks got, um, would they publish right now? I saw a panel last week with uh, one of the Iraq war logs journalists. They said they would, um, and probably in coordination. And I think that this is some sort of delirious thought that journalists have within their bubble of, I want to, I don't want to say, I'll say it, self-righteousness uh, that they have, especially in Britain, where they think they are actually protected um, but this case will actually uh, lead the way or is leading the way into incarcerations of mainstream media journalists. And this, this is how it is going. I mean, we are, we are going into an authoritarian state. And as uh, John uh, Ken Loach said, I mean, we can't really um, say Russia is... is any better than than the U.S. or, or China is any? I think that these all these all these regimes are 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 part of the problem. And the U.S. paints itself as freedom uh, and and as a, a law-abiding country when it's the leader in wars and in killing innocent civilians in hundreds of places in the world. Um, and how come there is no prosecutions? I mean, there, my, there's been a, an attack on the ICC recently by the US uh, when they were trying to bring some uh, investigations into war crimes. I mean, there is a lot of pressure from the US for these war crimes not to be prosecuted. 
Ken, any thoughts? You have to unmute yourself, Ken. I think you're on. No. Yes, I am. Um, new, new, Private Eye used to talk about new technology um, and pistol hacks, and I'm afraid I, I fall into that category when it comes to anything to do with digital media. Um, Yes, I'm going to talk, say a word about the, um, the, um, the, the liberal press. I mean, the Guardian, I think, bears a particular responsibility, but it, it's a pattern. Um, and, and it's very similar to the pattern of how they, uh, uh, how they um, endeavour to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. Um, and that is to smoke, throw up a smoke screen. And you see it through, it, it, uh, Corbyn was associated with terrorism, with anti-Semitism, with racism. With being old and incompetent, and the and then and, and from then on, the the ideas that he put forward were just not discussed. The policies, but the program was not discussed. They feel they tainted him, and I think they did. They tried to do the same with Julian, uh, with what happened in Sweden. And I think they, they, they so you you have that smoke screen, so that so we don't even need to consider this man now or what he's done or the great contribution he's made to journalism. We don't need to consider that. Because of this smoke, this uh, this this allegation, um, and the, the Guardian, the BBC, Channel Four, they've all fallen into that. When we have this extraordinary scandal, to use a, a mild word, um, extraordinary abuse of of, our, of of the law, of truth, of the failure to deal with crimes, and they refuse to discuss it. They refuse to give it the presence that, that it desperately needs, and they stand by while Julian is is tortured. In the words of the United Nations, so the, the, the challenge is to them. You know, if anyone watches it, then obviously the film should go to them and say, "Now, what do you now start telling the truth?" Because there's not much time left. I think that that, that that's where our target has got to be. Because there has to be a. I hope um, I, I hope Juan is right. Oh, oh, Susie, sorry, I hope, Susie, you, you're right, that the, the mood has changed. But we've got to do everything we can now with this great weapon um, that Juan's given us to, to, to put this in front of people so they cannot ignore the facts. Thanks, Ken. Your thoughts, Susie? Yeah, I mean, I think that was Julian's partner, Stella, who spoke about that shift in the narrative. Um, I think, you know, in years to come, there'll be a lot of analysis of the media coverage over the, on this over the last 10 years. But I think Stella's right to focus on the situation now and that there has been a shift. Um, Reporters Without Borders has been doing terrific work. Uh, the National Union, Union of Journalists has spoken out as well. Um, and just to the point about the... Um, the accountability situation, I mean, that's a historic question. It does look like there's a case going to the ICC around um, Afghanistan war crimes. And actually one of the lawyers involved in that is, is a, one of Chelsea Manning's lawyers. Um, obviously the US has freaked out about that and is refusing to grant visas to folks involved. Um, and I believe, I don't know the, all the details, but I believe there's also a case against the countries that had black sites where uh, detainees were rendered and were tortured. So I think there are some things in the work, but obviously it's it's a drop in the ocean when you see people like Kissinger and swanning around at you know book tours and all the rest. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, that's all I'd have to say for now. Thanks. Great, thanks. So we're also getting quite a lot of factual questions about some of the details of the case, which I guess this is a. This is an event designed to try and um, uh, expose some of the myths and the lies about the case. So I'll put them to you, um, uh, first of all. Factual question from Ismail Rashid from Iraq. What are the allegations that are being used for the case to extradite uh, Assange? Um, another question from an anonymous um, uh, messenger. Did Assange break a pre-existing law under the Espionage Act or not? And then a bit of a, a kind of um, slightly more um, uh, judgment question, really. What are Julian's chances, um, both in terms of the extradition case, but also if he does get extradited, 
um, what are his chances of being able to defend himself in the United States? Um, shall I go to Susie? Do you want to start just to change the rhythm oh. a bit? So I think going with the last question first, what are his chances here and in the US? I think um, the case can't get to the US because uh, as Juan's film beautifully illustrated, um, uh, in that sequence when John Kerryaku is talking about how he had uh, OJ Simpson's jury expert, uh, the district of Eastern Virginia is all NSA, CIA type people. So he's he ain't gonna win the charge in the US, uh, the case in the US. So we've gotta win this in the UK. Um, it, it can go to appeal a couple of times and this process may take a while, but I think the legal team are confident because, um, you know, for so many reasons, the political nature of this case, um, the, all the due process violations, you name it, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, I think to go back to the Espionage Act and how that was used, this is the first time a case is being brought against someone um, doing journalistic activities, um, again, you know, using the Espionage Act against them. Um, the, the, what they're saying is not that uh, WikiLeaks was involved in spying or that kind of thing, but that they received classified information and that this is the problem. The, the receive, receiving classified information and then sharing that classified information. Um, and an important point that I think the film makes is, um, and, and the Washington Post revealed this as well, that the Obama Department of Justice realized they couldn't prosecute WikiLeaks for doing this under the Espionage Act because there was no way of charging WikiLeaks without charging the New York Times and the Guardian and so many outlets for doing exactly the same. So I think a key point is realizing this is the Trump Department of Justice doing this, not the Obama DOJ, even though we know the Obama DOJ is no friend of whistleblowers and all the rest, but even they realized they couldn't prosecute. So this is really unprecedented, the use of the Espionage Act in this way. It's the first time prosecuting journalistic activities in this way, and it's very much connected to the Trump administration. And I think that's a key, key, um, key precedent. And there were a couple of uh, sources from the Obama DOJ who spoke out in that Washington Post piece and said that they don't think, you know, the extradition case should be going forward. Thanks, Susie. Juan, have you got any comments on those questions? Sorry, before that, I just got a text from uh, John McDonald saying, I visited Julian in Belmarsh prison and saw the conditions in which he's being held. I became came even sure, surer of the need to secure his release. This innocent man and... Uh, an Uloktal prisoner whose life is being being month, month and month by month, month taken from him as a result of the acquies, acquies this government to the American diktat. All people who believe in justice have responsibility to demand his release. I'm sorry for my dyslexia there, uh, but that's a message from John McDowell. Um, concerning Julian's case here, I think I cannot think of a single um, human right that has been respected uh, in his case right now. And, and that actually gives me hope that either this magistrate, magistrate or higher uh, judges in higher courts um, notice this. I mean, this is a man who is arbitrarily detained, according to the UN, who is being psychologically tortured, according to the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, who has not had a chance to defend himself. He hasn't seen his lawyers in six months. Uh, there's been a superseding indictment, um, which he, as far as I know, hadn't read last week, and he's starting his trial at, on the 7th of, of September. He hasn't had the right to a defense. He has been spied upon. Um, and actually, we all have we all have been spied upon. We, I was uh, on a list uh, uh, of special people to spy on, and they were spying on his private medical um, um, uh, consultations. And more importantly, they were spying on 
his private, his, his privileged legal conversations with his lawyers. And I think this is something that is sufficient enough to throw the case out the window without, uh, uh, as well as uh, including the fact that 17 of these charges are of political nature and the extradition treaty between the United States and the UK does not allow for political prisoner extraditions. Thanks, Juan. Ken. Um, only one quick addition to that. Um, I think, I think uh, th there will be political intervention. There has been so far, we know that. So a lot will depend on the, uh, on the balance of that, uh, that discussion that goes on. Uh, there must be people in the judicial system who say this is intolerable. But on the other hand, there will be political pressure to not to fall out with the US. So uh, who knows what that is, way beyond my pay grade to, to even speculate on that. But we just know it will go on um, and it will be significant. Um, so otherwise, you know, why, why would Julian be in Belmarsh? Why would he be being tortured uh, and under this pressure if there was no political intervention? So it, it's the balance between in that political struggle that um, is difficult to foresee, but it's sure taking place. Can I just can I, can I just add one, one quick thing? Brilliant to hear from John McDonnell and remind us what a tragedy is that this man is no longer in the leadership of the Labour Party, nor even in government, which is where he should be. Um, sorry, I, I just I just wanted to add that I've spoken to several legal experts and they have told me that whatever happens, either if Julian wins or the United States wins in this um, um, in this round, shall we call it, there's going to be an appeal. And that even if Julian wins, that doesn't actually sec securitize his his release. Uh, it. it, it it is possible that he will be in prison for the next couple of years while this this um, 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 trial this procedure goes ahead, and we must put as much pressure as we can to try to alleviate his situation in prison and try to get him out on bail. Um, try to put as much pressure on the government. I mean, the government has the power to stop this right now. Priti Patel and Boris Johnson have the power to stop this right now. So this can be a political decision. It is up to us to, to make them decide to do that. Okay, Juan, and before I go on to another round of questions, just uh, a number of people are asking, how can they get hold of this film? How can it be used? How can it be accessed? It's already on my Twitter. If you go on to JL Passarelli, is this with double S and double L, um, you'll be able to see it. Um, the, the Stop the War uh, YouTube uh, will have it shortly. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's even a way to watch it uh, on PeerTube, which is a non proprietary platform for those people who pref prefer having their privacy and not have to log in to see something that has age restrictions because of the violent content of uh, the material shown at the beginning of the film. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, right, we've got some sort of more general kind of political questions, partly about the US. Um, the first one is, will the election result make a difference? What would happen if the Democrats get elected? Will that have an impact on the situation as opposed to Trump? Um, the second is from Susan Olech. Um, why is it that in the United States, given that the media is under such massive attack from Trump, they're being almost humiliated in, uh, in press conferences, there's clearly all sorts of censorship and intimidation going on. Why is it in those circumstances that at least sections of the media aren't being more supportive, aren't reporting on um, the Assange case um, more, more uh, systematically and effectively? Um, and the final question in this round, and this may indeed be the last round, is um, what can I do? A number of people are sending that question in. How can I most effectively campaign? Uh, there's another linked question which is why are we pursuing the legal um uh, the legal route when 
we need to have more direct action and more protests and so on uh, and so forth. So um, there's sort of range of questions there. I'll, um, who wants to start? I'll, I'll start with, I mean, um, it's difficult to think, is, to, put your, to put my mindset into what the US media is thinking. Um, for me, it's kind of flabbergasting that it hasn't been uh, more investigated. I mean, it's such a sexy story, right? You have espionage, you have attempted murder, you have judges with uh, alleged con conflicts of interest, you have alleged corruption in the <clears throat> court, <clears throat> the, in the CPS uh, that involves the, um, the head of the Labour Party. Um, it, um, it involves torture, it involves uh, all sorts of uh, um, um, uh, interesting aspects, but uh, um, there is something that is, is, is not going through. And, um, and that's what we have to try and, and, um, and, uh, and figure out. Ken. Um, well, I think we, we should never um, underestimate the depths to which the, uh, the press will sink. Um, the, um, the, the, they are, even the liberal press will, will only go so far. And this is demonstrated here again, as it was when I mentioned earlier in, in their support for a left social democrat leadership in the Labour Party. They will not go that far. Um, they, in the end, they like being the being seen as as the critical um, um, the critical voice, but their criticism only goes so far. They won't rock the boat to that extent. Um, you know, you, you you've seen it over and over and over again, decade after decade. Um, when push comes to shove, they are with the establishment. Um, it's, I mean, we and during lockdown, I've been very reliant on. BBC having dodgy eyes now, and um, you realize when you listen to it a lot, you realize the the lack, the, the very narrowness of the views that you hear, um, and this is in in the broadcasting institution, which you know is held up as an example of objectivity, and um, you know in in the words of one comedy character, objectivity my ass, it's um, it, it ain't objective, and. Um, they will, they will only go so far. And I think we, it, it'll need um, a mass um, campaign when the voice in the street or the voice on social media is so strong that it cannot be ignored. Um, but they won't do it unless they're absolutely pushed and shamed into it. There are one or two good people there, of course, but by and large, they won't do it. Um, of their own volition, they won't do it. They're Tories at the top. Um, the whether the the election in, in the states would change things, I, I don't know. I, I don't know American politics enough to uh, to um, to say. But I think the key thing is, at this point, we need a massive campaign um, on every avenue we have, pursuing every avenue we have to to um, to make to make this case that that one has made so clearly. There, there is an uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon happening with the. Um, prosecution, they seem to be doing everything in their power to push this case to after this n November the 3rd. So there are po political um, links to this and uh, I cannot say exactly what they are if they're expecting that maybe a Democrat government might change things or, or even support them or if uh, Trump gets in, um, or, or, th or that maybe this even becomes an election um, uh, subject. Um, but the, the, the prosecution is definitely trying to do anything, everything in their power to, to hold off until after November 3rd. Thanks, Juan. Susie? Um, our, regarding what we can do, I think many folks on this call, call are quite involved in efforts. Um, there are obviously a couple of petitions going around, the Reporters Without Borders, Amnesty's petition at the moment, um, they're sharing the film, there's the campaign to raise money for Julian's legal funds that Stella Morris has put together, 
all the usual things of writing to your M MPs. I think also trying to amplify the good media coverage. Um, Declassified, a UK investigative site, has done a lot of good coverage around conflicts of interest. So I think amplifying the, the good coverage is key. Um, and then I think also amplifying, you know, people um, like Ken mentioned, uh, David Davis, a conservative MP, amplifying sort of establishment figures um, who have spoken out against this case, um, the sort of unlikely figures who have political clout who've spoken out. And I think it's really important to elevate those voices as well um, to show that there's a, there's a broad section of people who are against this. Um, as far as the US elections, it's hard to know. I've had strong cases made from different points of view. Some people say the Democrats hate WikiLeaks so much because of what happened in 2016 and the DNC emails. Um, but I think there's another way of looking at it, which is we have an opportunity if Biden becomes president, we have an opportunity to at least push Biden to, um, to abide by Obama's legacy of not prosecuting WikiLeaks. Um, when the New York Times interviewed uh, the presidential candidates, Kamala Harris said she would seek to restore a non-politicized DOJ. So in her response, she was commenting on the fact that this is a politicized DOJ. Uh, Bernie said he wouldn't prosecute under the Espionage Act. So I think we can, you know, I don't expect anything necessarily massive to come from it, but I think we can make noise in the media to say, hey, Biden, abide by what Obama did. This is a Trump uh, prosecution. You don't want to go with this because this is aligning yourself with a, with a Trump DOJ. Um, and I'm sure other folks have suggestions, so please pop, pop them in the chat because we've got a lot of campaign people on the call. Okay, thanks very much uh, to all of you. Is there any last comment that any of you want to make, particularly when it comes to practical things that we can do? Come to the court, the Old Bailey Court on the 7th of uh, September. Uh, we need as many people as we can get here. Um, um, the COVID restrictions mean that uh, many people that were coming from abroad are not gonna be able to come and we really need to show our support uh, to, to Julian and, and make it shown to the magistrate that there's, there's people watching. We are all watching. That's, that's important. Okay, well, look, I wanna say thanks very much to all three of you, to Juan, Susie and Ken um, for a very, very interesting discussion. And of course, special thanks to Juan for making what I think is a very, very important film. Um, I also wanna thank everyone who's, um, who's tuned in today, who's joined the webinar. There's hundreds and hundreds of people who've come, as I say, from all around the world. And apologies to the many of people who sent comments or asked questions that we just haven't had time uh, to fit in. But I think the most important thing is what we've kind of ended on, that it's a really critical moment now both in terms of world politics and in terms of the case uh, 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 against Julian um, Assange. And of course, the two things do relate. I mean, if we could get a win here, it would be a massive blow against the kind of attacks that are taking place around the world. So please do get involved in the campaign in the ways that people um, have suggested. And just two particular things I want to emphasize practically. One is that next weekend, next Saturday, uh, the Don't Extradite Assange campaign is hosting another uh, webinar, this time with Alex Wal Alice Walker, Noam Chomsky and Daniel Ellsberg. So that's one also not to miss. And that will be obviously two days before the case restarts. So that's got extra importance. And finally, just to emphasise um, that uh, the importance of actually getting out into the streets and protesting. I know it's difficult times and not everyone can do it, but it does really matter and it does make a difference. And there will be a protest uh, in front of the Old Bailey in London, which is where the case is being heard at nine o'clock uh, in the morning on the 7th of September, that's Monday week. Please do your best to get there. And I know there are also protests taking place at the same time in uh, cities around the world at the US embassy or the British embassy. And I think that they'll be put out on the chat now so you can, you can catch some of those. But if not, 
Um, check out on social media the Don't Extradite Assange campaign to get more information and to get involved. So thanks very much for everyone who's come along today. I think this has been a very, very good uh, film show, but also a very important discussion. Um, and please get involved and let's do all, I, all we can to make sure that Julian Assange is freed. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Solidarity with Julian. Yes, Assange.